Hi everyone and welcome to what will be episode 61 from Off the Arrow Shelf. I'm Rob, uh, your host, and hopefully you'll find this of use and of interest. A bit of a series of recaps. It sits away from the ideas I was going to do on this podcast, which was initially on course laying and details about course laying. Now, the reason for that is in the last podcast, I put a poll out asking what people would like to see in future podcasts. And one of the things that came back was guests and also tips and advice about archery and coaching and the like. So I'm going to touch on the latter because I haven't got any special guests today. That's a bit of a shame. Anybody you want to come on here and be a special guest, please do give us a shout. You know my email address and my details. But anyway, this is uh, episode 61. A few recaps on what's been going on recently. So the latest NFAS magazine is out. That's National Field Archery Magazine, the January, February 2023 edition. And in there, there are the proposals for voting. Now, for those of you who don't understand, every year members of the society can put in proposals to change the rules. And those are voted on and the end of voting, if memory serves, is around about the 20th, 25th of February. I just found it on the magazine. So this year there are uh, five proposals and it is really important that you, if you are a member of the National Field Archery Society, take this opportunity to vote. There's something like six and a half thousand members of society and on average a good turnout is maybe 500 people vote. So first off I'm going to say that's really important. Um, it's going to be a hip bit hypocritical because I've not yet voted and the reason for that is I am waiting for the new NFAS uh, membership cards to come through because on the back of that there is a web ID which is a unique ID for each individual that is required to do online voting. Once that comes through, which is probably going to be later today or maybe in sometime this week, then I'll be able to vote. For those who of you are interested, as I said, there's five proposals and it's a little strange because three of the proposals I can't vote on and two of them I can. And the reason for that is three of the proposals are based on specific shooting classes. So there's one for bare bow. There's one for compound limited and there's one for unlimited, which is compound with all the sites and release aids. Because those are specific alterations to that shooting style, only those people who can shoot those styles can vote. Interestingly enough, all three of them share one characteristic, all three of them are around the use of binoculars and to facilitate people shooting in those classes to be able to have binoculars. Those of you who know me, I'm quite in favour of people getting binoculars. I'm in favour of all classes having them simply because I I shoot hunting tackle, I shoot flat bow. I like to be able to see what I'm aiming at. And when targets are 30 to 70 yards away, I can't see what the wound lines are on those paper faces or even on some of the 3Ds. So I could execute a really good shot, hit the target, and then find, get down there to find out that I've shot in the wrong place because I don't know that face. And before anybody says, oh, you should learn all the faces, oh, well, no. If I had binoculars, then I could just look and I'll know what that face is. And you can't learn all the faces because quite a few clubs produce their own unique faces, whether they be hessians or paper faces. And then you can't learn that one because you'll never have seen it before. And there is a group of people who say, well, you wouldn't be able to do it if it was hunting style. I mean, if you were hunting in real life, and I'm going, well, actually, there's a lot of hunters that use binoculars. But equally, there's a lot of hunters that wouldn't be use a, using a 35 pound bow to try and hit something that's 70 yards away. So let's be a little, a little bit realistic. Anyway, so those classes are voting for the use of binoculars to allow them to have that. Uh, there's a Another groundswell of people saying, well, why don't you just put a picture of the target um, at the shooting peg so everybody can see what it is? 
that doesn't help because there's an awful lot of work for the course organizers and the course layers for that the other two class the other two things that are being voted on are uh, new scoring points um, for what's called the pro kill so currently under NFAS you have a wound um, a kill zone and an inner kill and the inner kill only counts the 24 points that's generated from an inner kill only counts on the first arrow they're talking about using a pro ring which goes on within the inner kill um, you'll see that on a lot of 3ds and on some paper faces and i think he says grab it in the magazine just to check i think they're on about putting that to 27 like 26 points or 28 points yeah 28 points that's it so that it keeps that four different so it's 28 24 uh, 20 16 so the pro kill again is only counted on the first arrow i think i'll probably vote for that i'm not sure i haven't quite decided yet i think it's quite useful there's been a bit of confusion because it's been suggested by quite a few people proposed by quite a few people that are compound archers people have thought oh it's only for compounds no it's actually for all the other one is the same proposal as last year which is for a new crossbow class um, which would be a crossbow class shooting uh, wooden bolts wooden riser it's almost like a traditional crossbow um, no 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 sights on it other than the iron sights personally not a fan of this and it's all down to the fact that they're insisting on it's got to be a wooden stock if they were saying it was shooting a crossbow with wooden bolts and it can be any riser material doesn't have to be wood then that'd be great because that would be the same as hunting tackle because you in hunting tackle you can use any kind of recurve bow you could shoot an olympic recurve with wooden arrows and feather fletchings or you could shoot uh, a one piece recurve um, off the shelf with wooden arrows and feather fletchings that would be great but they're putting this limiter in of uh, it being only a wooden stock and i don't like that largely because we've got a, that aspect i think is a bit elitist um, wooden stocks are incredibly expensive not everybody can afford these so if you're wanting to try and improve and make it more accessible to people don't put that limitation in that's my view anyway feel, feel free to differ everybody's opinion uh, is it attached to their own opinion but i'll probably vote against that one i'm going to give you some thought but i'll probably vote against that one but the important thing is get out there vote take the opportunity because if you don't vote then you know your, your voice isn't heard and you've got no real right to then complain you can complain but is you're not really justified in it because you chose not to vote uh that's on nfas what else is going on we've had a busy weekend on sunday we were taking a group of scout assessors and these are individuals who are scout leaders or who are assessors of scouts so they're, they're the ones who give a, so those of you who understand under the in the britain we have the scouting organization and if somebody wants to teach scouts to shoot they have to be certified to do that and to do that they have to go on a training course and be assessed and we had a group of the assessors come around and experience field archery and experience at NFAS field course and it went really well and it's we had about half a dozen of them they shot around well over half our course took the entire day we took them around in small groups as a bit of a taster session it's a bit of a kind of a cpd for them um, continuing professional development for their own qualifications and what was interesting a lot of them were very nervous because a lot of them are very much target archers they're not used to shooting in a woodland in fact none of them had actually shot in a woodland before and they were nervous about losing arrows and what was involved it actually went really well we didn't lose any arrows uh, they all went away happy they all had the experience of understanding the different risks that are associated with setting a field course when it comes to overshoots deflections of trees but also the complication of the fact that we're setting a field course 
and the person in that shooting group, one of them could be shooting a longbow with a different caster, or somebody shooting a crossbow in the same group, to somebody shooting a 300 feet per second compound bow, or arrow from them compound bow. So that was that was good. Um, it was a long day because we started. I was on site, I think, from 8:30 and didn't leave till 4:30, but it went it went really well, and it was very interesting to have the the different eyes and different perspectives that they bring as experienced archers but from a different discipline to field and explaining about why we would set a target there why our target faces are close to the ground why we're changing some of these shots because we're going to be putting different size bosses in etc so there was a lot of work involved but it went really well and from a coach point of view speaking to other coaches discussing ideas discussing techniques it was really beneficial so on to something that i'm going to talk about which is to do with coaching and uh, i'm actually going to be citing a couple of different things here some of you may remember that there is a podcast i've spoken about previously which is modern outdoor survival very good um, podcast it's a couple of people in the uk that i know up in north wales and they talk about everything about gear reviews and advice on one door kind of hill walking survival by aspects sort of clothing you need preparation and stuff like that and they have three rules that they always cite in the podcast one is instagram is not your training provider prioritizing training over shiny new kit is really important and the third one is the importance of making good decisions at the right time now i was thinking that is applicable in many ways to archery as it is to outdoor survival and hill walking and the like instagram is fantastic for getting messages out there as is youtube but and this is the important thing it's not a training provider it gives you ideas it might point you in a direction but you can't learn everything from that you still need to spend some time with coaches to be able to view things to be able to ensure your setups are right and all those like shiny new kit christmas has just gone lots of people with new kit lots of people with new arrows lots of new new bows buying new equipment is really important because you will change the dynamics change I've just bought a, a 30 pound flat bow the important thing though is you still got to have training you still got to have expertise in the use of that kit it will help you yeah you know that lighter arrow might allow you to have a, a smaller gap if you're gap shooting it will fly that bit faster but you still need to be able to know how to draw that bow to get the back and make sure that bow is set up correctly and then the final one I'm going to go back to is this idea of the concept of making good decisions at the right time field archery is all around about making good decisions at the right time and those good decisions might revolve around having the right stance knowing how to take a shot knowing when to not to take a shot and come down which is the hardest lesson to learn if you take nothing from this podcast, go away. Next time you're in the range, next time in the wood, and say you're shooting four hours for your practice, draw up, shoot your first arrow, draw up, hold, and then come down before you shoot your second arrow. Then draw up and shoot it. Shoot your third arrow, and on the fourth one, draw up and come down again. Train yourself that just because you're drawing up to take that shot doesn't mean you have to take that shot because there will be circumstances and situations where you can't. And that's what is like making good decisions at the right time is important. Knowing when to take the shot and when not to take the shot is equally important. So give that some considerations, give that some thought, because from my, my perspective as a coach, as an archer who has struggled, sorry, if you can hear rustling, it's me just opening up my notes who has struggled and in some ways still does struggle with a bit of target panic with a bit of concerns 
it is really important to be thinking about things along those kind of lines making decisions making the right decisions at the right time so I just realized I just hit the um, pause then. So the last thing I'm going to say again is making decisions at the right time and making the right decisions. So another aspect I'm going to be talking about now with regards to coaching, and that is, it's actually taken, or what got me thinking about it is reading a, a book to my son. And those of you who've got kids might know the book um, Zog. It's also been a, an animated um, film and it was shown over Christmas again and in there there's a there's a scene where Zog who is a baby dragon is being instructed by Madam Dragon who is the teacher of the class to and they use this phrase of um, pra um, practice and they'll, they'll teach you something so Madam Dragon teaches them to blow fire in one episode teaches them to fly another one teaches them to f fly as uh, well each year they, they teach a new thing so they sort of uh, madam dragon will turn around and say uh, in year one the dragons were taught to fly and now you're you've learned to fly you can go off and practice on your own when you're fully grown you'll be able to fly perfectly well by that it almost sounds like either that madam dragon who is the coach effectively is abandoning them to go off and practice on their own and in reality you don't want to be practicing on, the, on your own you've if you've got a situation where you've got a coach there to be able to help you uh, formulate your practice and focus your practice fantastic you might have other archers that will be able to observe you maybe video you shooting or something along those lines because practice on its own doesn't make for perception but so perception perfection practice makes for progress not necessarily perfection there's this kind of theory that practice makes perfect well no perfect practice make goes towards perfection but the whole idea of practice is to make mistakes to fail at something so that when it comes to applying it in the real world or in the real situation you've done that practice so that when you encounter a situation, you know what to do, how to act, how to react, how to move. And I always say this to people is that failing should be thought as a first attempt at learning. Because that is each time you fail, you should be taking something away from it. And this is really important. I said earlier about these um, coach assessors or these um, scout assessors, archery assessors that were down at the wood. And I was explaining to them about footing in a field course isn't going to be necessarily flat. And how on the practice range, I've got a couple of breeze blocks, which are like cinder blocks, builders blocks. They're about um, six inches high um, blocks, 12 inches long by six inches. And I will put that at the shooting peg and have the person's leading foot on that and their back foot off it so they're naturally and even and then they'll shoot a few arrows and then I'll swap it round. And the whole principle is for them to get used to having that uneven footing and for them to be able to have to try and adapt for that. If you've practiced it on your range, then when you come across an uneven footing at a course, you are able to cope with it. Likewise, I'll put a target right at the bottom of the boss and I'll put a target halfway up the boss and I'll ask my students, I want to see two arrows going into the bottom target and the next two arrows going into the top one. So they have to learn to teapot, they have to be able to adapt because some of the targets we will be shooting would be a bedded target or a low target, other targets will be on legs or a standing target. If the people have practiced this, and they are and then encounter it then they've got the advantage of being able to adapt they've got that under their belt they've got that if you want to call it muscle memory i rather call it the experience of actually being able to address this because shooting can be stressful it, it can be a situation when you are under stress the adrenaline kicks in your heart starts pounding you're being potentially watched you know, and it, it can be quite stressful, especially at competitions, especially if 
if you're there in front of your peers and other people are watching you. So going back to what I said, to, said before, you know, exercises like drawing down at a shot is really important, and I'm going to give you an example of why. Many years ago, I was at a 3D tournament held in the Midlands. It was my turn to shoot. The other archers in the group had shot, and I happened to be shooting last. I went up to the peg, looked at the target, thought, OK, not a problem. Loaded the bow, set myself up, drew up, hit my anchor point, about to let it release, and a dog ran straight up in front of it. I stopped. I didn't release the arrow. I came back down. My heart was pumping because I'd literally had seen this dog run out from the undergrowth straight in front of the target, run up to the me members of the group, and then run off again. I was shaking. I was really nervous. And what had happened was there was a footpath on the edge of the woodland, and there were signs everywhere saying, there's an archery tournament taking place, there's an archery course in the swords, please keep your dogs on the lead. And a group of dog walkers had come down the path, a path that they use time and time again, and had decided they were going to let the dogs off and run into the woods. Now if I had not practiced coming down, if I had been, and I used this phrase the other day, kind of zoned in or zoned out, if I had been zoned out and had just been going through my shot sequence and you as soon as I hit my anchor I need to release that dog would probably be dead because I wouldn't have been able to stop myself it wouldn't have been a controlled shot I, there was nothing in there I've used the phrase go back onto earlier podcast feedback loops and feed forwards yeah the feed feedback and feed blocks if I had not been able to stop myself I'd have shot that animal and I would have been in tears because I'm a huge dog lover. Of, and that is really important why you've got to practice that aspect of stopping and coming down. Because situations will present themselves. I made a comment earlier about uh, modern outdoor survival podcasts. If you listen to, I think, yes, series three. It's episode 303. So I think it's series three, episode three of series three. There's a comment in there about dogs and chainsaws. And Rich is talking about a situation of where he was, uh, he'd, the tree had fallen down and he was logging um, these branches up. And literally as he's going through, he's got the chainsaw running, a dog runs up to directly in front of him where the chainsaw is. And for those of you who are dog lovers, don't worry, the dog was fine, everybody was okay. The importance of that podcast was the fact that he reacted. He got the muscle memory and he reacted to the situation. And I'm amazed, you know, it, it, chainsaws scare me. I have got them, I've used them for years. They still scare me. They're the one power tool that does kind of make me stop and think. And I'm incredibly careful when I use them. If you go away and listen to his podcast, he'll understand what he means when he talks about reacting to a situation and when the the adrenaline kicks in and you do something. And what he actually did was he managed to, and I don't know how he managed to do it, quite frankly, he managed to kill the chainsaw, uh, throw it so that the brake, the chain brake came on, and at the same time bring his foot round and actually, it sounds horrible, but kick, push the dog away in the chest. And he, the dog actually knows him and was coming over because he just recognised and that he doesn't. The dog doesn't have any fear of the chainsaws or anything like that. But it really shook him up. And there might be emergency situations where you will be in this situation where it comes to archery when you're taking a shot and something like that happens. But likewise, on a smaller scale, there may be the situations where your stance is different and from what you're used to but you've got to take the shot or maybe you have to draw up diff uh, differently. You know, you can't do a T draw, maybe or push pull draw, or you, you do something different. Whatever it is, if you haven't planned for it, if you haven't practiced it when the situation presents itself to you, you may not react in the correct way. I'll give you a story now about a good compound archer that I know. 
and we were on a shoot and what they'd done is that the people had set up a hide so that it's a hunting hide and those of you in America will know of them um, I've used this, a similar sort of things for when I used to do photography and the idea is you go into the hunting hide and you take your shot from within this and it's basically like a large well not a large it's smallish tent now you've got you can either take the shot from in there or you can take the shot from outside I physically had to take the shot from outside because I was shooting my flat bow it's a 68 inch flat bow I couldn't fit the flat bow into the hide that's the nature of it which was a shame because I would really, really like to have given it a go and I did actually try but literally my bow was sticking on both ends of the side uh, out of both sides of the, the, the hide this archer he shoots a compound with release out went in got himself settled on the seat in there drew back very focused on shooting through the small hole yeah bang he'd focus so much on getting settled and being able to see through the gap and draw up he hadn't loaded the bow so he dry fired the bow you if you are presented with a situation which is different to your norm don't know how you're necessarily going to react if you've built up experiences you may not be in exactly the same situation but if you built it experiences where you've had to adapt your footing adapt your stance to take a shot then if you are presented with it you're more likely to be able to react in a proper way in a safe way so think about this you know you could almost use it as um, learning scenarios of what if scenarios base them on how other people around you react so you might be shooting with somebody and they don't react very well to a noisy environment and um, I know this other podcast high power arch we've called, talked about this about having music playing in the background so people got used to noises around you if you're somebody you can only shoot in silence and then suddenly you're at a tournament and there's a lot of noise around you it's going to be very hard so practice practice with noise around you practice with other people being really close to you or shooting in a confined space you know a really good tip I've done in the past and they've used in the past is I've just got simple bamboo poles and I've put them by the shooting pegs and I've made people draw up when they're in a, in a smaller confined space and it's made them suddenly realize well actually yeah I am quite flamboyant when I'm getting ready so I need to be able to react and I need to be able to control myself to be able to fit into the gaps so if you see somebody struggling with noise if you see somebody you can only shoot in silence go away and practice in a noisy environment yourself so you don't fall foul of that if you see somebody shooting in a crosswind and really struggle think about okay how would i cope with a crosswind how would i manage to do it so on a windy day go out onto your range and have a go you know, the best golfers in the world go out and practice in the wind in the rain because when they go to a tournament they don't know if they're going to have a high winds they don't know if it's going to be raining and we're the same we should be out there anyway um, I'll call it a day for that I'll return to doing um, elements on the this podcast with uh, course laying in the next ones I've got ones and it's a really exciting topic well I'm being sarcastic here I'm going to be talking about the risks and how, how you go about assessing risks and our risk assessments when it comes to archery and course laying probably in the next couple of podcasts and re uh, visiting some other materials as well but in the meantime i hope that's of use to you go away have a think let me know and if i could help i'll be more than happy to take care thanks for listening to this podcast if you'd like to get in touch with any questions or suggestions for future podcasts, then drop me a line. My email address is off the arrow shelf at yahoo.co.uk. That's off the arrow shelf at yahoo.co.uk. Or you can check out the website off the arrow shelf.com. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks for listening. <laughs>